Thank you for calling. This is Chris. In this video, you'll listen in on a phone call between a military member named James and his mortgage advisor, Chris. They'll be discussing whether it's a good idea for James to buy a house, even though he knows he'll be moving again in three years. I know that no article or video you found has answered all your mortgage questions. That's why this video is not gonna give more general rules. It's gonna provide specific advice based on James's situation, which can help you answer your own mortgage questions. Stick around until the end to see the real numbers involved. And if you want more detailed answers like this to take the stress out of mortgage, make sure to subscribe to Chris's channel. Disclaimer, Chris is actually my dad and I play James in this video so that you can have real relevant advice. Hey Chris, uh, my name is James. I am looking at getting a mortgage in Washington and just wanted to check in. I, I don't know what you need up front, but my wife and I are moving from Phoenix, Arizona area over to Washington. We're trying to figure out if we should be buying versus renting. We're only planning on being there a few years. I'm in the military and I'm not sure it's gonna be worth it to buy. How certain are you about the three years? Yeah, it's pretty much for sure gonna be three. I don't know okay. where exactly I'll be after that, but okay. I know it's, I'm pretty much gonna be moving again in three years. Okay. My sort of general bias in this situation is gonna be probably not. Um, but that doesn't mean that in your specific situation, and we'll talk more about you know, the different circumstances that, that might tilt it one way or another. And you know, at the end of the day, it's not wholly objective, right? You know, the, the, there's a visceral element where you know, uh, just the, the joy of owning a house, you know, sure. what your specific skill sets are, your, you know, what your plans are for the house, all of that will factor in but my sort of general premise, you know, that I kind of start with is that the risk and the selling cost associated with a home are, you know, fairly, fairly, fairly high. Right. right? Yeah. You know, yeah. That's why we're um, unsure. You know, you sell this, you, you sell a share of stock, the, the selling costs aren't that significant. You sell a house and you know, you're looking at, and I round this up, but it's, you know, 10% selling cost. And so, you know, there, there, there needs to be some fairly significant upside, you know, just from a purely financial standpoint. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So just to give you a sense, we, uh, we're, we, we currently own a home. Uh, we're on a VA loan right now. Okay. And we think our, our house is worth somewhere around 600000 we're currently at about 50% equity. Um, okay, so, so you know, owe about 300 or so? Yeah, and we've got about 100,000 we're willing to use uh, in addition to put towards a house. Um, you know, we'd like to own a home. Uh, we, we'd prefer that to renting overall, but it, it's not to the point where we're just gonna throw a bunch of money down the drain if that's yeah. what it's gonna cost. Yeah. And one thing I should add is I do believe our my employer would pay for um, some of those moving costs, including some of those okay. um, possible, possibly closing costs, possibly possibly selling costs. Selling there. costs for yeah. your next move. Okay, and that's yeah, you know, that's that's a you know, that that's a very important element because you know because that is one of the you know one of the concerns you have is that selling costs are fairly significant. So if you're going to have ten percent selling costs, and you're going to be in a house for three years then, you know, to break even, you must have had, uh, you know, at least depreciation of 3% per year, you know, or three and a third right. you know, percent yeah. per year, yeah. you know, just, just to break even on that. If you have, you know, appreciation of three, you know, 3% per year, three and a third percent per year, then you're going to break even on that if somebody else is covering those selling costs for you. And then in the meantime, you know, you've had the opportunity to yeah, to improve the home, you know, potentially do better than just general market appreciation, you know, depending on kind of, are, are you the type of people who get into a home, you know, like to find a fixer and, and really kind of, you know, get your, get your hands dirty and, and fix it all up? Or are you just, you know, are you people like to find something that's kind of ready to live in and, and, and maybe you'll, you know, you'll, you'll just keep it up nice over the years? Um, we're willing to do some work and, and take on a few projects, but, you know, we're not going to take something from double it in value or anything. Okay, yeah. And then, you know, from the, from the financing side, um, you know, you already have your, you, you have an existing VA loan. You know, the, the main thing with VA, you know, typically your interest rates are cheaper. Of course, you don't, you know, you don't have to put anything down. You guys have a very substantial down payment. Um, and so you won't need a VA loan. It'll be nice to consider, you know, just to compare the interest rate on a VA loan with the interest rate on a um, conventional loan, mm. you know, yeah. a, a non-VA loan. 
but typically that that funding fee and the funding fee is is that one time additional closing cost that VA charges, and it's you know for that's going down here coming up in April April seventh so functionally right now essentially for you know things that you're considering right now, um, you know the funding fee is two point one five points and that's just you know that's a percentage of the loan amount right and and so you know it's a fairly mm. sizable yeah. cost. The interest rate is typically cheaper with, with VA, and VA doesn't charge an, a, a monthly mortgage insurance cost. But in this case, that's not really going to be a differentiating factor because you have so much money down. If you go conventional, you won't have a mortgage insurance cost either. Sure. And so, really, what we'd be doing mm-hmm. is just comparing kind of the VA loan with a with a conventional loan. We're not going to compare what's the par rate on a conventional loan with a par rate on a VA loan because to get that rate on the VA loan. Subsequent use is going to cost you one and a half points. You know, with when you're putting more than five percent down, um, you, your VA second or, or later use funding fee is going to be one and a half points. So what we would do is we'd say, okay, let's look at the mortgage insurance. I mean, let's look at the conventional interest rate with one and a half points versus the VA. I see. Okay. And um, so I, I guess you know what you're telling me so far. The biggest thing that you've told me so far is that you think your your employer will help cover some of these selling costs. So then it really becomes really a function of what's your risk tolerance, and that's the other thing that you need to consider. You know, when you're moving into a market and you think you're going to be moving out of that market fairly soon. Sure. If you were getting a new VA loan with zero percent down, for example. Um, you know, that would be a fairly high risk factor, right? Because you, you've got no equity into the house. And so if you right. don't have appreciation yeah. and you do have to cover any of your selling costs, you could end up with a situation three years down the road where, you know, you don't have enough equity in the house to sell it and mm-hmm. fully cover your loan. And so, that, you know, that's, that's just another layer. Again, none of these are definitive saying, well, you should or shouldn't. Right. Um, but the fact that you have a lot of equity, the fact that your employer will cover or possibly cover you know, a fairly significant portion of these selling costs, then really kind of boils down to what, you know, what, you know, what's kind of the visceral element, how important is it to you live in your own home, to be able to do the, you know, to, to have a garden and right. do all of these yeah. things in your own yeah. property. Um, yeah. You know, and, and then how, what do you expect the market to do in the next few years? You know, we're in a market right now where you know, their their you know predictions are all over the board, right? You know, people you know some people think you know that that housing prices are going to go down. Many people feel like we've already seen the worst of it, you know, and that we you know maybe we're going to start to see things kind of flatten out a little bit and maybe go up. Um, but I think those are the you know those are the sort of decisions that you would have to kind of filter in. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I'd say just overall, we're not trying to gamble either way. Like I said, it's important. We we'd like to be in a home, but we're not going to do it if it's if it's just going to be a massive loss, um, right. both in terms of the costs and um, you know if there's a lot of risk in terms of depreciation. Um, but I think that this is helpful. I think uh, it would it would help to see just start to see some real numbers because um, the, the concepts you're ma- you're talking about make sense. Um, is there a way to you know you mentioned different different options, different rates. Um, is there a way to start to see some just just possible numbers in terms of monthly payment so that we can compare those to rent or anything as well? Yeah, oh yeah, you bet. So that um, what's your you know, what's your kind of price? You know, have you started to kind of look at housing over here, look at Redfin or whatever and, and kind of look at different options and see what's what's attractive to you? Yeah, so we are generally we we've, we've poked around a little bit and it seems like something around eight, eight to nine hundred thousand would be in the right price range for okay. us. So what I'm going to do is, um, you know, I'm going to assume ten percent selling cost from your Phoenix home. Sure. And so, you know, I'm, I'm going to net you out. I, I, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll maybe a little bit less. So I'm going to, you know, that would be sixty grand. I, I'm going to net you out at two fifty. I'm going to say you're going to bring two fifty from your Phoenix sale. Okay. And you're going to add a hundred to that. Because you mentioned yep. you had a hundred extra, you, you want to put into the deal. Yeah. And um, and so that you know that means you have a loan amount of about five hundred fifty thousand. And then this is what I like to do typically with new clients is is to stress test your objectives by really going at the high end of where you expect hmm. to be. 
Yeah. Um, because you can always go below that, yeah. but I'd like to kind of at least start at the See high end and say, okay, what, what does that do for us? How does that qualify? Now, you know, from a total payment standpoint, you know, we can look at, you know, what your interest rate would be today. And like I said, we can compare VA versus conventional you yeah. know, when we do that. Um, but, um, you know, we will use kind of rules of thumb for real estate taxes okay. and homeowners insurance, you know, for a price for a house of that magnitude, we're probably going to have at least $150 a month, let's say, for homeowners insurance. Yeah, you wouldn't have to pay that much, but that's not unreasonable to assume that much. Sure. Um, I assume property taxes at 0.9% okay. um, of the purchase price. That's, again, just a rule of thumb. And then I'm going to go ahead and just kind of price this out. Now, one thing we haven't really talked about is, is your credit scores. Um, as far as you know, how's your overall credit based upon what you've described? I assume it's probably pretty good. Yeah, I think we're probably around 740. So let's just press you out and see what you qualify for. Now we talked about, you know, you, you've been in your job for a couple of years and you have a salary of 120000 or $10,000 a month. So we went ahead and put that in here and we're looking at pricing um, a $550,000 loan amount on a $900,000 purchase. We have a fairly substantial down payment. And of course, that broadens our possibilities, you know, of the potential loan programs available. Of course, you're a veteran, um, and that opens up uh, VA programs to you, but you may or may not benefit from that. That may or may not be the best option for you because you have so much down. One of the big benefits of the VA program is that they have uh, a zero down payment program. And it's a really tremendous program, and it helps a lot of vets get into homes. But if you have a significant down payment, sometimes conventional pricing will be better. Now, I think we'll find this time it's going to be actually pretty close. And, uh, you know, and then you can kind of decide which way you want to go. But if we start, let's let's assume conventional. Uh, and one of the reasons we assume that is because the VA program has a funding fee. Unless a vet has been um, disabled in some way and is exempt from the funding fee, then that funding fee will vary depending on whether you're a first time um, uh, VA user or a subsequent VA user. And now in your case, you're selling a home, you've already used your VA once, you're a subsequent. And with that much down, your VA funding fee would be 1.4% you know, of the loan amount. And so, you know, if you're borrowing 550000 that's a $5,500, almost a $5,500, excuse me, it's actually more than this, about a $7,700 funding fee that's going to be tacked on to your closing costs. Now, again, that might be, that still might be your best option, and I'll show you why, but let's start by convention, you know, pricing this out conventionally. Mm -hmm. And so if I go into the pricing, and if I go mm -hmm. product and pricing here, and I just kind of run the numbers, I've already got your data in here, got your credit score, you've got a good credit score of 740, that's kind of what we're expecting. We're borrowing 550, and we price this out, and we see here that, you know, let's look at a conventional 30-year fixed rate, and what we see here is that, you know, on any given day, we don't just have one rate. Lenders just, you know, they don't just offer, here's my rate for the day. You have a whole range of rates available, you know, from a low here in this program of 4.875 to a high of 6.375. And you as a borrower, you would choose one or the other depending on your relative value of the long-term lower rate. So you have a permanent rate here. But you see here the points, you know, they, they, they charge you an extra $27,000 in fees to get this rate versus at the high end, they're saying, well, you can go, actually it goes much higher than that. You go to 7.625, yikes, but they'll give you a, a rebate or a credit against your closing cost of $10,800. And, and, you know, there are times when anywhere on this chart makes sense to different kind of people with different motivations. So it's, it's just important for you to understand kind of where, you know, what those motivations are, when they would apply. But in general, most people are going to fall kind of around the sweet spot where the lender is saying, this is my par rate. This is the rate that we're not charging you any extra fees. You're still going to pay for your appraisal and title and escrow and all those people involved in your transaction. You'll still pay for them, but we're not charging you extra to get this rate. Whereas if you said, no, I'd rather have 6%, then you say, well, that's below what we're offering right now, you know, at the par rate, but you can pay an extra $2,400 in closing cost one-time extra cost, and you'll get a permanent reduction in rate. Or conversely, if you thought, well, you know, I don't want to pay that many closing costs. I'm willing to take a little bit higher rate. And there are many reasons why you might do that. A, you don't have the cash. It's just a necessity. Or you think you're not going to be in the loan that long because you think you might refinance soon or pay it off soon. So you go, yeah, I'll take a higher rate. And then the lender says, okay, I'll pay you $3,100. 
to take a rate above market. But generally, we're going to be pricing out around here. Now, one thing I want you to I want to point out to you is where the rate goes to if you're willing to pay points. And the reason for this is I'm going to compare it with a VA option. Right now, we see that our conforming no point option is going to be 6.375. It's close to no points. We, you know, if this were a real deal, we would do an exact rate calculation in between these eighth point increments and give you an exact rate right exactly at par. But right now, we're just going to use this as a stand in for par at 6.375. You know, you are paying $572 in extra cost, a small discount here. Uh, but that's roughly where the par rate is. Now, I, I, before we met, I ran the comparable VA pricing for this same loan. And the VA pricing for this same loan was around 4.75. And the, but the funding fee, and this is where you kind of make the, the, the comparison between a VA and a, and a conventional, it's not always that straightforward. You know, if you're coming in with zero down, then a VA is going to be the way to go. And again, it's a great option to have. But if you're coming in with significant money down, then you can't just say, well, what's the par rate for a conventional versus the par rate for a VA? Like the par rate for a VA right now, I think, is about 5.74. And you think, well, that's a lower rate. But remember, that comes with a funding fee. That's a one-time extra cost that the VA calls a funding fee. And that goes to, the, to fund the VA program. So, you know, it's, it's, it's good to keep that program going. But you're paying to get that rate, 1.4 points. So what we would really do if we wanted to com compare a conventional loan to a VA loan is say, okay, if I'm going to also pay six, you know, 1.4 points, if I'm going to do that, if I go over to the VA, what would 1.4 points buy me on the conventional side? And we see here it would get you kind of close to 5.75. And when you kind of work that out here, this is 1.5 points. So it's slightly more expensive to get to 5.75, but we're talking about hundreds of dollars, not really thousands of dollars difference. And there might be a reason why you go with the conventional loan versus the VA loan if you are within a few hundred dollars. And, and, and here's that reason is because when you go to a seller, if you go to a seller with a VA loan, one of the things the seller has to sign is what's called an amendatory clause. And basically that means the seller is not allowed, you're not allowed as a buyer, as a VA buyer and borrower to negotiate away your right to waive the appraisal. So let's say you're in a competitive bid situation, there are other bidders and the, and the other bidders come in and say, look, I, I know this property is selling for 900 or 950, where, you know, 900 I think is where we are. This property is selling for 900, maybe it won't appraise for that, but I'm willing to cover a low appraisal down to as low as 800,000. So that borrower or that buyer comes in and says, I'm willing to waive the appraisal contingency as long as it doesn't come in less than 800000 As a VA borrower, even if you absolutely wanted this property and we're going to be absolutely fine with it coming in with a low appraised value, you would be willing to do the same. You're not allowed to do that. Contractually, everybody has to sign. The buyer has to sign it. The seller has to sign it. The seller's realtor has to sign it. And your realtor has to sign it. It says, we all agree and understand that notwithstanding anything else, in this loan, the veteran can't be held accountable, can't be required to go through this deal if the, the appraisal comes low. So if the appraisal comes in low, you get your earnest, earnest money back, no questions asked. And so for that reason, if a buyer has a choice, they may look at that. They may or may not. You know, you, it, it's really kind of in the mind of the, of the seller to decide, is that enough of a difference in these possibilities? Maybe the seller looks at it and says, look, I want to, you know, I'll, I'll take that risk because I want to support veterans. I'll take that risk because I think my property are appraised fine. There's all kinds of reasons why they might go through with it anyway. Uh, but they might also look at it and say, you know what, that's a risk. You know, uh, if it does come in low, this deal doesn't go through or I have to reduce my price. And this other offer is going to go through if it comes in $100,000 or low, whether or not it does or not. And so that's one of the reasons you might consider, even though the pricing may be close, a conventional loan versus a VA loan. But in your case, let's just start with the conventional, which is what we have here. Let's keep it at 6.375, assuming we're not going to want to pay those points. And we can talk about that. I've got a different video that I might reference you to go look at or I'll send to you later that talks about why I generally don't advise paying points. But let's just say we're going to go here. We're going to, you know, we're going to go ahead and take the 6.375 on a conventional loan. And so here's where your kind of monthly payment's going to be. Your first you know, this is your principal and interest on your mortgage, about 34, 76, 37. 
and then I'm assuming homeowners insurance of about 150 a month. Now you can pay less than that, and you can pay more than that. Uh, insurance the insurance market is vast. There's many different options you can have. Be aware of someone that's just saying, "Hey, I can beat that premium," because anybody can. Uh, insurance has so many different components to it that you can tweak those components and you can end up with a cheaper product, but it may not be all you need. So just make sure you got a good agent um, that knows what they're talking about, that isn't just saying, I can get lower than that, because then maybe you won't have enough coverage. Um, but you can definitely do better than that. I like to be a little conservative right now at this stage of the game. Property taxes, because we're talking about a hypothetical house and not a real house, I just use 0.9% of the purchase price. Now, in some states, when you sell a property, property taxes automatically reset. And so, you know, it would automatically reset to a certain percentage of the purchase price. That's not the case here in Washington State. Their uh, property taxes don't automatically reset by a sale. They're just assessed year after year. An appraiser goes out, an assessor goes out and assesses the value of your house in light of other properties around. And so, until we have a specific property in mind, we just use a rule of thumb. I use about 0.9% of the purchase price. It could be more than that. It could be less. When you have a real property that you're looking at, we'll take a look at that. You know, send me the property address. We'll pull very, you know, we'll pull the actual property taxes so you'll know this component. Of course, we'll update interest rates and everything at that point. And really, that's your all-in payment at that point. That's going to be your total housing cost, about 4301. Your debt-to-income ratios is one of the key metrics that they're going to look at as to whether you qualify for not or, or not. With conventional loans, with, with decent credit, you can generally be, you know, you can be absolutely confident, you know, 45% debt to income ratio or less. Between 45 and 50, you can be pretty confident, you know, confident as well that you'll get that through. Fannie and Freddie conventional loans have a hard cap of 50%. And so you can see here with your gross monthly income at 10,000, you have no other debts. And so they would add any other debts. Let's say you had a car payment or student loans or any of those kind of things. We would add that to this to come up with what they call the back end ratio. They have a front end ratio, which is just housing only. And then the back end, which is housing plus all other debts. And if that number got over 50, well, then that would be a concern. That would be something that we may not be able to get you qualified for. Um, and that could be a reason we go back and look at the F, at the VA loan again because they qualify in a, in a in really a wholly different manner. So that's something to consider another day as well. But in this case, you know your payment comes in just fine with your salary at ten thousand. Your debt to income ratios are pretty comfortable, and so I think you would qualify for this. So anyway, I'm going to send this over to you. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go ahead and print this estimate for you just so you have some numbers to look at, and then as you kind of go out and start shopping, looking at specific properties. Send me the address and send me the price that you would think about considering because I'd be happy to keep updating you as you go. If you want to schedule your own phone call with Chris, go to clevelandstreet.com. If you want to do some more of your own research, check out the videos on our channel.